You're listening to Honestly Aging by Friends Life Care Vigor, a podcast where we explore what it's like getting older, the peaks, the valleys, and everything in between. In this season of Honestly Aging by Friends Life Care Vigor, we're covering topics related to solo aging. I'm your host, Cheryl Prosca. Let's grow old together. On today's episode, I'm joined by Arielle Weiss. Arielle watches how the world moves. Trained as a dancer and choreographer, she delights in helping her students move freely and has nurtured a lively private practice teaching Alexander Technique in Philadelphia since 1988. In addition to her online classes and courses, Arielle teaches in person at her center city and Delaware County Studios, at the Curtis Institute of Music and Crosslands Retirement Community, and also coordinates a wellness program for surgeons at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. She presented her TEDx talk, Posture Myth Busting in 2021, and is interested in bringing Alexander Technique to a wider audience centered on core values of belonging and agency. In fact, at the height of the pandemic, Ariel led a six-part virtual series for Friends Life Care members. You can join her weekly class for seniors, Move Free, Feel Free, on Zoom, Tuesdays at 10 a.m. Ariel, welcome and thank you for being here. How are you today? I'm doing just great. Thank you so much for having me, Cheryl. Absolutely. So, Ariel, you are joining me today to discuss the Alexander Technique, cultivating a growth mindset, thriving as we age, and more. So, to get us started, can you tell us what is the Alexander Technique? <laughs> I'm happy to do that. Sometimes I think it's the world's best kept secret, but the Alexander Technique is an educational method. It was developed by Frederick Matthias Alexander just about 120 years ago, and it's a process that allows us to restore our optimal functioning. So how we do that is we become aware of our habits of thought and habits of movement, and we start to recognize habits that are not helping us. And those habits of excessive tension or not optimal functioning, once we recognize those habits, we learn how to prevent them and redirect them into useful energy. So now how can the Alexander Technique help older adults specifically? Well, one thing that can happen as we age is that things start functioning a bit differently, right? Mm. Parts wear out as we age. Um, and so it becomes even more important to use what we have to the best of our ability. If you think about the mechanics of a car, it's a kind of a crude analogy. But if you just let your car run and run and run and never went and had it serviced or tuned up or aligned, you wouldn't get the best gas mileage. You wouldn't get the best performance from that vehicle. So we're a lot more complicated and sophisticated than an automobile, but the analogy fits a little bit. Uh, we want to really use all that we can as we age to continue functioning and doing the things we love to do. And I'm also thinking that like the the longer I do something, the more of a habit it becomes, whether it's a mm. positive habit or a ne or a negative habit. Um, and if, for example, I've been sitting or standing or thinking the same way for many, many years, especially as I get older, it it's not as easy to break something like that by my by myself. So having somewhat of like an intervention of sorts, someone who mm. can help me learn how to behave differently sounds very integral in improving for the future. 
Oh, I love that point, Cheryl. I couldn't agree more. And that kind of flexibility of thinking is directly impactful on the flexibility of our own movement. So if you think about as we age, we tend to feel a bit stiffer, right? We lose some flexibility. That's physiological, right? We, we have less fluid. <laughs> Our tendons and everything's change as we age. And so it becomes even more important to use all the flexibility we can have and not just succumb to that rigidity and that depletion of resources. So I want to get into a little bit more about our mindset. So how would you say our mindset impacts than what we're doing? Well, your mindset impacts everything about you because we are always physicalizing, embodying what we think. I love to do experiments with my students and have them think of something really troubling for a moment. So if you think about something, maybe uh, it's a task you have to address today that you're not looking forward to. I know I've been having to call my insurance company, which is not one of my favorite things I have to do. And so I can feel as I think about that, a tightening. I might even hold my breath or my neck and shoulders start to grip. And so if I change my thought and I think about a recent visit I had with family members and uh, hanging out with my four-year-old great um, nephews, well, I feel things change. My breathing just opened up and my shoulders got a little softer. So in a funny way, we start to learn how to bring that easeful coordination into our challenging tasks. Because if I'm bringing my dukes up and my stressful coordination to difficult tasks, I'm actually making those tasks more difficult, if that makes sense. So mindset is everything. What you think is what you get in, in shortened version. And you you brought up the word like embodied. Mm -hmm. So what is an embodied mindset? Well, all mindsets are embodied. And so this idea that our mind and body are together is not something we have to create together. They already come together. And in our Western civilization, we tend to think of those things quite separately. Mm -hmm. I, I am a big teaser. So I also tease my students that they think their brains uh, come into play when they're sitting at their computer. And then they think their bodies show up at the gym. And I'm like, nope, you have, they always are together. So when you're sitting at a computer, if you're not paying attention to what you're doing physically, a lot of people will get up from working on a computer and all of a sudden, ouch, <laughs> notice that their neck or their back or their wrists are bothering them, that maybe they didn't notice while they were sitting and typing away. Same thing happens when we go and do a physical activity. Maybe you play pickleball and maybe you don't really pay attention so much to how you're moving. You're just kind of in the zone which is great. We want to be in the zone, but we want the zone informed by our best coordination, which mindful movement is very helpful for. So what I do is I help people notice that they're always connected, what you think and how you move. So that embodiment is a physicalization. It's not something you have to turn on. It's something you can notice is already happening. And what comes up for me is driving. Because mm. I know if I'm driving, particularly in a congested or situation, or maybe I don't precisely know where I'm going, I will hunch and scrunch. Mm -hmm. And then I end up leaving the car and I just, I'm, I'm just tense for quite a while longer. So it makes sense exactly what you're saying. I'm sure there are so many other points of my day where if I was being more mindful about the way I'm either moving or positioning my body, I'm sure I would I would feel physically and mentally better. Well, it's certainly worth a try. And I absolutely love that example. 
And I know in my lifetime, I've spent a lot of time in my car going from one job and one activity to another. And I noticed my driving, hurrying, worrying habit in a similar way. But here's the funny thing. It's a really understandable response to be a bit frightened <laughs> driving on the, <laughs> I'm thinking of the Schuylkill Expressway. I find that at a very harrowing experience. And so my response to be on alert is really reasonable. However, if my shoulders are hunching and I'm holding my breath and tightening my arms, I've actually made my response time slower. Because if you put the brake on something and then hit the gas, you don't go as quickly. So even though it's understandable that I'm anxious about driving, that response is not helping me be safer. So again, I want to intervene with my thought process and say, oh, I'm feeling a little anxious. I need to stay alert. I need to understand who's around me. Yes, I need to understand where the controls of my vehicle are. And then I want to stay inclusive and flexible in my thinking and my movement because that's what's actually going to keep me safer. So one more point about mindset, I'm wondering if we could dig into a little bit. Can you talk about a growth mindset versus a scarcity mindset? <laughs> Happy to. It's something I'm really noticing amongst my peers that uh, many of my peers, they have kind of a diminishing world. They have things they like to do and things they don't like to do. They have people they know and they don't need any more people in their lives. So again, that's a kind of fixedness set, staying in place, which I would equate as rigidity, mm -hmm. right? unchanging. And I don't know about you, but whew, our world is changing quite rapidly, quite rapidly. And so um, I love the analogy of how skyscrapers are built. And apparently, the Japanese were the first to figure out that if you make a skyscraper and it's rigid, if an earthquake happens, which happens frequently in Japan, your building will fall down. It has no resilience. So in Japan, they were innovative, I think. I may ha have that wrong, uh, that they began to make their skyscrapers with flexibility so that when an earthquake comes, the building moves to absorb that impact, but doesn't fall down. And so for me, a growth mindset is a mindset that's not fixed, that has openness to figure out where you are and what is going to be most helpful to you in any particular moment. And so it's a what if instead of a uh, I can't mindset. And so again, as we age, things change. And certainly some of my functioning is different. <laughs> when I was in my 20s and 30s and 40s and even 50s, I did a lot of dancing where I jumped way high and rolled around on the floor. And now my dancing is more gliding and walking. <laughs> it's changed. I, but I didn't give up on my dancing, but I have changed to accommodate what feels best to my coordination and my joints at this point in my life. Would you prefer to age independently in your own home or live in a nursing facility? I know what I'd rather do. Friends Life Care membership offers just that. Plan today for a future lived at home with vitality, independence, growth, and resilience while protecting your savings. Learn about your options at a free seminar or webinar. Register at friendslifecare.org slash register or call 215-628-8964. So another topic I'm interested in hearing from you about is uh, the impact of language and self-talk. Can you discuss that topic for a bit? I would love to. So Mr. Alexander, when he was making his discoveries to try to prevent the habits that he discovered were interfering with his best functioning, uh, he had to figure out how to redirect himself. And what he noticed was that using words, what he called directions, 
were a very helpful tool in directing his thinking. So if when I asked you to recall a difficult situation, I was directing your thinking. We weren't necessarily doing it verbally. Maybe you had a picture in your mind, or maybe you were like listening to a scenario that had happened in, in, internally. Well, we're speaking with language to ourselves all the time. And so language is just a particularly useful tool for directing the thinking. Once you direct the thinking, you're always directing the movement. So it's a cycle. We choose our language to direct our thinking, to direct our movement. And then of course, the quality of our movement goes right back into that loop that's going to impact our thinking, right? When we feel imbalanced, we're usually much calmer, for instance, yes? If mm -hmm. I'm if I'm worried about stepping off a curb and I'm not really sure what's going on, right? Then that fear is going to physicalize with some tension, which sadly might actually throw me further off balance and make it more difficult to navigate that curb. If I get to the curb and I go, oh, I, I'm not sure how far that that curb that that step is, I'm going to take a moment and orient myself and see if there's something maybe I can put my hand on or just look at it for a moment until I feel ready to go, right? That's a very different approach. That's using language, right? What did I do with my language? Well, I gave myself a moment. I acknowledged that I was maybe unsure and I didn't judge myself for the unsurety. I made space for it to choose something that's going to be safer for myself. And uh, it always helps me to take a beat and take that pause, assess, really see, like, is this something to be worried about? How should I respond here? Instead of just like jumping ahead with maybe my the first thought that pops into my head, um, because it's not always the best thought. And it can sometimes be rather, rather reactive. So your yes. your guidance is very helpful in many, many situations. It's a funny thing that I've noticed. Um, I first noticed it with my great aunt Jean. <laughs> I noticed there was a moment when we were going to take my great aunt Jean out for lunch. And we got to the parking lot of her apartment building. And all of a sudden, she start, my great aunt Jean was well into her 90s at the moment, by the way. Mm -hmm. And we get to the parking lot and she starts bombing across the parking lot. It terrified me. And I realized that my great aunt was fearful of being in the parking lot. And her strategy was to get through it as quickly as possible, which of course was, was not a safe choice. But my great aunt Jean, of blessed memory, is, is not that unique in that aspect. Many of us, when we're worried about something, We'll try to get it over with quickly. And when we're talking about balance and safety, that's not a sound strategy. So the other part of that, what do I mean? How does language impact mindset? Is that in Alexander Technique, we call it constructive thinking. So if I say, oh no, there's a curb, I might fall. You're kind of aiming for the fall. You're wow. kind of aiming for what you don't want. If you say, oh, there's a curb I'm not familiar with. Oh, I wonder what a great way to, to navigate that curb would be. And I'm going to choose to pay attention to how I'm balancing over one leg in order to lower myself onto the other leg. Well, now I'm aiming for what I want, which is balance. Not aiming, I hope I don't fall, is aiming for falling. Mm. So that one simple trick about language, if I wanted to leave listeners with one simple idea, well, we already gave two, didn't we? Pause first, but it's pause to choose the constructive thought. Pause to choose what you want. I'd like to feel more comfortable. I'd like to feel more centered. I'd like to feel more balanced, right? And then, of course, the more sophisticated you are with how you could actually do something to be more in balance or comfortable, well, that's going to help even more. But just flipping that switch from what you don't want 
to what you do can be enormously powerful. And this is a lovely segue into my next question, which is how else can the Alexander Technique help us thrive as we age? Well, I think the Alexander Technique can help us thrive because it really empowers us with some tools. Mm. And when we feel more empowered, right, we have the agency to navigate in different situations. And so I think that's, for me, the biggest thing about this mysterious process of aging. None of us really knows what's in store for sure, right? <laughs> we we kind of get what we get. And so that can be a bit overwhelming sometimes. And understandably, may I just say. And so when we feel like we actually have some tools that we're not just like, oh, well, I get what I get. I do get what I get. And I have more tools in how I respond to what I get than maybe I previously understood. And that can be a game changer for people's whole emotional, psychological countenance, let alone physically. Um, as we age, if you actually come more into balance, that can just be liberating and such a joyous feeling. And working with uh, what I call my beloved elders. You know, I've had the great opportunity to work with many seniors well into their 90s. And to see them actually improve in their coordination is, is really quite a lovely gift that I'm so grateful for. And I'm think so uh, my, my grandmother's 96 years old mm -hmm. and uh, she, I, I always say she's better than ever. And what mm -hmm. I'll say is that she has always stayed open, not let things get her down. And in the past few years, she's actually started walking more, exercising more, and she looks better than I've seen her in many years. So just the fact that knowing from personal experience that someone in their 90s can make improvements thinking about starting it even earlier, how much that can positively impact someone like you're saying is uh, can, really like puts proof behind uh, giving this a try. Absolutely. Absolutely. And something else that you had touched on before was uh, as we age, we can get more rigid or worlds can get a little smaller. So to counteract that as we age, how would you say we can stay more open? Well, one of the things that happens as we age, even though our memory certainly changes and evolves, right? We start to lose some detailed information, but what mm. we gain is perspective because we have more life experience. So we understand the gestalt much more. We have a much larger worldview through our experience. And so if we get stuck in only noticing what we've lost, mm. we might miss out on that shift of the, the power paradigm in a way that we're much better at seeing context, relationships, patterns, and so it's that openness to understand, yeah, I'm changing. I'm always aging, right? A one-year-old is aging. A one-year-old is changing. Just as I, at 63, am aging and changing. And instead of only seeing what I've lost, right, there's that constructive thinking. It's like, oh, well, I'm a lot better at what I used, <laughs> what I do than I was 35 years ago. I have much more experience. And that really helps me do what I do. So it's just getting good is what I say to my students. And you have so many positive memories and positive interactions and experiences to draw on that if we can change our mindset, like we've been talking about to focus on what is positive in our life, what's positive coming up versus the negatives that do 
come up in life, that is a big, that's, that's a cosmic shift, as you're saying, to be able to change our perspective. Yes. And I do want to point out, it's not about ignoring the bad information and the bad experiences. Mm. We fully acknowledge them. I don't have to avoid them or ignore them. This comes up a lot when people are in pain. And sadly, as we age, that's a distinct possibility that we might have more aches and pains. And so I'm not saying that life is all good. I'm sorry, but I'm sorry to tell you, but if you're a human being, some not good things are probably going to happen. And so how do I hold those unpleasant experiences, right? And, oh, my shoulder is hurting. I might want to go see someone and see if someone can help me. So I'm not saying ignore it. I am saying don't let it swallow you up so you are your hurt shoulder. Mm. That's not a great life to live, right? If you let that demand all of your attention, I'm saying include that and say, oh, my shoulder not feeling so great today, but you know what? The other side's feeling much better. So I'm going to pay attention to them both. I'm going to pay attention to my whole self and I'm going to say, oh, well, where's feeling easier in me today? And maybe I can share and say, shoulder, come along with us. Mm -hmm. So the part within the whole is a very big Alexander Technique principle, right? So I don't have to ignore that difficult things happen. I include it in the larger whole because the solution and the help might be part of that larger pattern. So when we zoom out, and think contextually, which we are much better at doing than our younger peers, you know, our the generations that came after us. Um, we have more of a chance to, to find a viable solution. Ariel, can you share a success story about an older adult that you were able to help through the Alexander Technique? Mm. Well, I'm thinking of a very beloved student um, who I'm allowed to name her name of blessed memory and called me on the phone. She was 88 at the time she called me and her flute teacher suggested that she find an Alexander teacher because 88 years of age was learning to play the flute learning to play the flute at 88. And by the way, uh, the flute is one of the hardest instruments because it requires the most air. People wow. think it's a tuba, it's not, it's a flute. So I, I was happy to go and help a new student at 88 and a flute also requires a lot of twisting motion. And so his neck was hurting and I said, oh, I understand. That happens to a lot of flute players. I'd be happy to help you. Well, not only was she able to play flute without hurting her neck, she was so tickled that she was able to learn how not to hurt her neck playing flute. She became my poster child <laughs> for wow. learning Alexander Technique. And we would have lessons and she would have a list of things that she would notice were difficult for her. So one time I came and she used to have her tea very high up on a shelf. And she said, you know, I'm having difficulty reaching that shelf. And so we worked on how to reach that shelf without it pulling on her. And she became uh, kind of the role model for her peers at meeting. At and so they would all watch each other at meeting and it really took what I was showing her to heart. And so she would stop before she would sit down at meeting and she would pay attention to her coordination. And then she would lower herself with ease and balance. And then she would sit in meeting using those verbal directions to come into balance. And so then she started something. So they all would watch each other and say, oh, look what he's doing. So she actually started shifting the culture at her meeting that people would start to clue in to their own postural balance. So I think of often, and I'm so grateful for all the lessons I learned from her 
and the inspiration she shared with me and her peers. So in closing, what mm -hmm. steps can someone take now or more immediately to practice the Alexander technique and positively impact their life? Well, you can always try to find an Alexander teacher is helpful, just like a docent at a museum. It's helpful to have a guide. And you can always just start paying attention to yourself. You can start paying attention to where you are in space and how balanced or comfortable you feel. And even without a teacher, you can just start to get curious. Oh, how could I make myself feel more comfortable right now? Where is more support available to me? That curiosity, right, that willingness to not know the answer, please notice I never once <laughs> suggested that, oh, maybe I should sit up straight. Um, I did a TED talk about why that's not really a helpful thing mm. because it tends to have people push and pull on themselves and act more like a bully instead of a nice, gracious host that invites you in. So I encourage people to graciously invite yourself into a process of discovery. And actually, you don't need to know the answers. That willingness just to try some things and see what works for you is probably some of the best advice I could give. Well, Ariel, thank you so much for being here with me and sharing the Alexander technique and the many ways it certainly can positively impact our life. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Cheryl. Thank you for listening to Honestly Aging by Friends Life Care Vigor, a unique program focused on aging with vitality, independence, growth, and resilience. You can find links and show notes from this episode on our website at friendslifecare.org slash podcast. Thank you to Ariel Weiss for joining us today. You can learn more about Ariel and Alexander Technique Philadelphia on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Ariel's website, www.atphila.com. On Ariel's website, you can also register for her move free, feel free online class geared toward older adults. Ariel's TEDx talk and Friends Life Care six part workshop series, Living in Balance, can be found on YouTube. Links to all these resources can be found in the show notes. If you like our show, please rate, review, subscribe, and join us next time. To learn more about aging with vitality, independence, growth, and resilience, subscribe to our blog at friendslifecare.org slash blog. Mm -hmm.